you have your Bible, go ahead and open to Leviticus chapter 16. We've been working out of Leviticus 23 on the feasts. And we've come to the Feast of Atonement, Yom Kippur. <coughs> We'll get back into Leviticus 23 in the coming weeks, but Leviticus 16 is, is an in-depth study of what is going on in Leviticus 23 when they talk about the Feast of Atonement. We've talked a little bit about this. Um, we've actually covered verse 1 out of the entire chapter. My hope is today to get a good way into the chapter. <laughs> so we're going to start off, I'm just going to read a couple of chapters and then we'll, we'll go over a little bit more in detail as to what's going on. So chapter 16, verse 1, The Lord spoke to Moses after the death of, two sons, of the two sons of Aaron, when they drew near before the Lord and died. And the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron your brother not to come at any time into the holy place, inside the veil, before the mercy seat that is on the ark, so that he may not die. For I will appear in the cloud over the mercy seat. Okay, we're going to pause right there. Chapter 16 is a continuation of chapter 10. There are several intervening chapters. They're almost like a parenthetical statement. But then chapter 16 takes us right back to chapter 10. In chapter 10, uh, two of the sons of Aaron offered uh, fire and incense that was not approved, that was not holy. And as a result, they were struck dead. Now, Aaron had four sons, and, and the first two, the oldest two, were struck dead because they came before the Lord in an unworthy manner. Well, in chapter 16... God gives the reason for what he's going to say. He's, he's telling us, hey, you need to speak to Aaron because of the deaths of his son. There are certain things that are required to come into the presence of God. Okay? So, um, verse 1 of chapter 16 connects us back to chapter 10. Hopefully you guys went back and read chapter 10. So you can kind of keep up with what's going on here. If I keep backing up, we're going to end up all the way back at Genesis 1. Okay, so we're going to try and work our way forward from this point. So, in verse 1, we find the reason for what's going on. In verse 2, God is speaking to Moses, and he's giving instruction for Aaron, the high priest. And he says, tell your brother, don't come before me at any time. This is not something that you can do at your whim. He specifies that it's in the holy place, but it's inside the veil, which we know to be the holiest place or the holy of holies. And he gives an, uh, a description here. He says, uh, before the mercy seat that is on the ark, so that he may not die. For I will appear in the cloud over the mercy seat. Now, the mercy seat, the Hebrew word for mercy seat is kaporet. Okay? And it means a cover or a lid. All right, now, if we left it there, we'd have the understanding that the mercy seat is the lid that sits on top of the ark. And you back up a little bit, and God gives an explanation as to how he wants the ark built. Okay, and it's, it's made of acacia wood and it's overlaid with gold. And then he gives a description of the mercy seat, the cover, and it has the two cherubim on it with their wings outstretched to cover. The so one's on one end and the other's on the other end and their wings are outstretched to cover the mercy seat. Okay, and then God says that um, his presence will appear in a cloud above the mercy seat. Now, the mercy seat, if we just left it alone at a covering or a bed, that's not a bad place to leave it. 
Okay, because it gives us the understanding, a physical idea of what's going on. But the idea behind mercy seat, it's interesting because it's the same word that God uses when he's speaking to Noah about building the ark. And he tells Noah, he says, you shall build an ark of acacia wood. And he gives him the measurements. And he says, and I want you to cover it with pitch to waterproof it. That word cover it, cover, is the same word. It, it seals. It covers the whole thing. If he only did half of it, the other half would leak. Okay? So you have this understanding that it's not just a lid. Okay? It's not something that just, you know, they put on top because they didn't want an open box. This is something that is representative of covering the whole. Okay? So kind of get that set in your mind because the mercy seat was the greatest place on earth for its time, because the Spirit of God dwelt above the mercy seat, okay? And you cannot come before the presence of God at your whim. There's a, a, a process that God is going to lay out for how to approach Him, and you can only do it, you, not you, not me, only the high priest can do it one day of the year, all right? So we're going to go forward here, picking up in verse 3. But in this way... Aaron shall come into the holy place with a bull from the herd for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He shall put on the holy linen coat and shall have the linen undergarment on his body and he shall tie the linen sash around his waist and wear, lin wear the linen turban. These are the holy garments. He shall bathe his body in water and then put them on. And he shall take from the congregation of the people of Israel two male goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. Now, there's a whole lot of information here. Um, I, I told you before, I am working off of the teaching, the writings of um, Dr. Fruchtenbaum. Uh, I have read, at this point, I've read six books and numerous, oh my goodness, numerous websites that give information. He sums them all up beautifully. So if you have the opportunity, I would encourage you. Uh, Dr. Arnold Fruchtenbaum uh, is talking about the feasts. Uh, this is specifically uh, dealing with Leviticus chapter 16. So a um, couple things that we want to address here. First, only Aaron, the high priest, was allowed to come. Out of all the priests, only Aaron. Out of all the people, only from the priests was he drawn. Out of all of humanity, only was Israel selected from which the priests came, from which the high priest came. Okay? So, by extension, the high priest is going in as a representative before God of humanity. Now, we'll see in this passage... You go, well, he's, he's talking about the Jews and, and the customs that the Israelites had, and, and how does that apply to me? Because we go back with the understanding that God's plan from the beginning was to use Israel that through them he could reach the world. God's plan was not to just redeem Israel. God's plan was to redeem all of mankind. And he situated Israel at the crossroads of the nations, that weird little spot on the east side of the Mediterranean Sea where the roads from Europe and Africa and Asia all met. And he put them there that they might be a testimony to his goodness and his grace and his power and, and the, the very fact that he existed. Now, it doesn't take long. You get into the founding of the people of Israel in Exodus, you, you get into their coming in to Israel. As a matter of fact, I'm, I've been working through um, Joshua, and, and now I'm into Judges, and, and it took one generation. From the time Israel came into the land, it took one generation before they fell, before they blew it. They said that the generation that Joshua was a part of, when that generation died, those that had seen the mighty works of God had died, <coughs> Their children grew up not having seen the works, and they fell to, to foreign idols. Okay, one generation. 
So don't look down your nose at the Jews because at least they had it for a time. Okay? We wouldn't have done any better. All right? We look through the eyes of the Holy Spirit that has been sent to indwell us. Okay? And we go, wow, I can't believe that they would do that. Um, you know, we would have too. Okay? That's a testimony to the goodness of God's grace. All right? So, in verse 3, he shall uh, come to the holy place with a bull from the herd for a sin offering. Now, we're, we're going to find out a little bit later as we dig a little bit further into this. The, the opening statement is just kind of a summary, and then God's going to break it down step by step as he goes. But the, the bull offering is for Aaron and his family. Aaron has to uh, be made right, be made holy, before he can come into the presence of God. He has got to bring in the blood of a bull and present that before God. So, we talked a couple weeks ago about Yom Kippur, and, and we say, you know, this is a, a day of national atonement. This is not a day where you come before God because you blew it and, and you, you committed a sin. See, that was, we talked about uh, before the Feast of Trumpets in the, the month of Elul. They called that the month of preparation. That's the month when you were supposed to go through and go, oh man, I might have blown it. Oh, I did blow it. And you were to take your own personal sacrifice and take it to the, to the altar and have it sacrificed so that your sins might be covered. You couldn't hang out till the Day of Atonement because if you came to the Day of Atonement and you were not right with God, this atonement would not cover you. Okay? You had a personal responsibility to be made right with God. So before Aaron even comes into the holy place, he has got to make sure that his sacrifice has been paid. Okay? And then it says, and then there's a ram for a burnt offering. Okay, and we're, we're going to get in a little bit deeper. We're going to step into this, but it's important for you to know that before Aaron can come into the holy place, to the most holy place, a sacrifice has to be made on his behalf. Okay, blood is shed on his behalf. Well, then we get down into verse 4, and it talks about the garments. And it says that he will have the linen uh, cloth, and then the undergarment, and the turban. And it says that he's to, to put all of these things on. And then down at the bottom um, of verse 4, it says, He shall bathe his body in water and then put them on. Now, my understanding is this was not the high priest's robes. This was something different. This was a garment that was used one time. Okay? And then it was put away. And the next year, a new set would be made. This was not the normal priestly garments. There's, there's not the ephod. There's not the urim and the thummim. There, there, this is different. But he has to wash himself first and then don the clothes for this sacrifice. Now, we just talked about having his sins covered by the blood of the lamb. But as a symbol of that, he has to purify himself as well. He has to be washed clean. And then he has to put on new garments, a, a new set of clothing that are pure, that have not been soiled, so that he might go in before God pure. Okay? And then in verse 5, And he shall take from the congregation of the people of Israel two male goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. I'm going to leave that alone for just a minute because when we come down a little bit further, like I said, this is just the intro. You know, this is the, the synopsis at the beginning of the book, and we're going to get into the actual book in the following verses. So down in verse 6, Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering for himself and shall make atonement for himself and for his house. That's what I was just discussing with you, that Aaron... Uh, he had to make sure that his sins were covered. So, in this, he had to have a bull offering for his sin and a ram offering for the burnt offering. He had to have garments that were not what he normally wore. 
Okay, now if you if you studied at all in Exodus and, and Leviticus and Deuteronomy and, and the requirements for the priests, you know that the priests were given garments that they were to wear in the temple, in the tabernacle when they served. These garments did not depart the temple or the tabernacle. They came in, they washed themselves, they put on these garments. When they were done with their service, they would take off their garments and they would don their regular clothes and go out. Okay? And, and so there was this, this uniqueness about them inside the tabernacle and inside the temple. All right? So he had a, a bull and a, and a ram, and he had the special garments, um, and then he also had the offering for the people, which was the two goats and the ram for the burnt offering. So moving down a little bit, um, verse, well, let, let me make sure I don't have another note here. Okay. Verse 6, Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering for himself and shall make atonement for himself and for his house. Then he shall take the two goats and set them before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of the meeting. And Aaron shall cast lots over the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for Azazel. Okay? Who's Azazel? Well, the, the scapegoat is what the goat is called. Azazel, there's, there's actually several different theories as to who Azazel was. One was that Azazel was the personification of all evil. Um, and, and the other is that Azazel was just the name that they would give to the scapegoat. And then the third is that Azazel was the wilderness, which represented separation from God. Okay? Which they believe we don't really know because Scripture doesn't tell us. All right. Um, so he takes the two goats. He's already made atonement for him and his house. Okay. So everything that he's doing from here on out is ritually pure. And the two goats are presented to him. Now, there is a theory that, that I've been told in, in Hebrew tradition and it's in some of the rabbinic writings. It is not in scripture. But I thought it was interesting enough that I want to share it with you. Okay, according to custom, according to tradition, when the goats were brought before the high priest, he would cast lots. One goat would be chosen to be the sacrifice unto God. And then the second goat, the one for Azazel, would be the one to bear the sins away from the camp and to take it out into the wilderness. Okay, and the, the, the teaching behind this, and we'll see as we get a little bit further in there, is when the lot fell, the high priest would take a, a thread, a red thread or a ribbon, and he would tie it on the horn of the goat. That was for Azazel. Okay, a similar thread or ribbon would then be attached to the tabernacle or to the temple wall. And then when the goat was taken out. Um, now there are several different the theories as to what went on. There was a person that was given charge of the goat. He was to take it out of the camp, out into the wilderness. Some people say, according to some of the rabbinic writings, he would take it up to a plateau and he would make it fall off the edge to its death. Okay, this was so that the goat wouldn't wander back into the people and bring the sin that he bore away and bring it back into the people. So, so both goats died. All right. So according to the rabbinic writings, the, when, when this goat went and it died, according to the history that the Jews have given us, not the scripture, this is not scripture, so don't go dig it through your scripture and go, well, it's not in here. I'm telling you now, it's not in here. Okay? But up until about 30 A.D., when that goat died, the thread or the ribbon would turn white. And that's how the priests would know that it was done. So the, the ribbon on the wall, or, or some people say it was ribbon, some say it was thread, uh, that, that ribbon would turn white. But after about 30 A.D., it never turned white again until 70 A.D. When the, when the temple was destroyed. It never turned white again. Okay. Now you can look 
in the, the Jewish writings, the writings of the rabbis, and they will attest to the fact that it ceased at approximately 30 AD. All right? Does anybody know what happened at approximately 30 AD? There was no longer a need for the sin to be born away in 30 years. It had been born away as far as the east is from the west. There was no longer a need for the two goats. Okay? Now, I tell you that because... Um, you know, I, I've heard several people talk about it. As a matter of fact, uh, about four months ago, uh, my mom had sent me and asked the pastor a question about this. And I said, well, I, I have never found anywhere in Scripture that it talks about this. But I have read that, you know, it's in some of the writings. Well, between her and I, we, we studied this a little bit, and it, it's not in the Bible. But I think it's an amazing thing that, that the Jews that do not accept that Jesus was the Messiah are attesting to the fact that when he died, the thread no longer turned white. Okay? It's kind of like the matzah. These, these that are given the gifts of God and they create the matzah to be striped and pierced, and that's the, the requirement for the, the matzah. And they don't understand the connection to um, Christ. Okay? So, he selects the two goats. One of them will be for the Lord to, as a sacrifice, and the other will be for Azazel, and, and it will be taken off, and it will be killed. So, going down a little bit further, um, So down in uh, verse 11, we're going to pick up there. Aaron shall present, now we're, we're getting back into the details. A lot of people go, well, man, this is so repetitious. Why does he have to tell us multiple times? Because we don't get it with one telling. Okay? Uh, this is something that teachers have known from the beginning of time. If you tell a student once, 95% of them aren't going to get it. You tell them twice, maybe 40% will actually pay attention at that point. You tell them three times or more, then they'll start getting it. All right? So he repeats. It's like this circle. He gives them the first part, then he goes into a little bit more detail and comes back around, and then he goes into more depth and brings it back around. God knows that we're, we've got very short attention spans, and so he gives it to us in pieces. All right, so Aaron shall present the bull as a sin offering for himself and shall make atonement for himself and for his house. He shall kill the bull as a sin offering for himself. And he shall take a censer full of coals of the fire from the altar before the Lord and two handfuls of sweet incense beaten small and he shall bring it inside the veil and put the incense on the fire before the Lord that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is over the testimony so that he does not die. And he shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his finger on the front of the mercy seat on the east side and in front of the mercy seat he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. All right, so right here, we're still stuck in the prelude. Okay? This is what has to happen before the atonement for the nation can be made. Okay? We're still talking about the personal atonement for the high priest so that he might be made clean and pure so that he might offer an atonement, a sacrifice for the nation. All right? And you see that God goes into a little bit more detail. He's to take the blood, the blood that was sacrificed out by the altar... He's to take some of the blood from the bull. And then he's also to take an, a, a, a censer full of incense. And he's to bring it inside the holy place. Now, does anybody know what stands right outside the veil in the holy place? Uh, what, what, what article is there before you go into the most holy place? What was that? That's off to the right. The altar of incense. The altar of incense. Okay, The altar of incense sets right before the veil that separates God, the presence of God, 
from, from humanity, from the holy place. And so when Aaron comes in, he's bringing in the blood. He has to take some of that incense and put it in a censer before he can go in to the most holy place. All right? Each of these steps should show us how holy and how righteous God is that even the high priest needs to make preparation before he can come into the presence of God. All right? So he brings in the blood. He brings in the censer. And the, if you look in verse 12, I'm sorry, verse 13, it says uh, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is over the testimony. Why? So he won't die. Okay? Does anybody, can anybody think about um, another time that incense is used as going up before the presence of God in the book of Revelation? Prayers. The prayers of the saints. You see, there's nothing in the Hebrew Bible that does not have an answer or an equivalent in the New Testament. Okay? They're not two separate components. They are one part of a whole. Each one part of the whole. The, the foundation is laid from Genesis to Malachi. All right? And then the walls are built from Matthew to Jude. And the roof is put on and the house is ready in Revelation. All right? So when you're looking at, at these things, always keep your mind fresh and with what's going on, what's been promised in the New Testament, those things that have still yet to be fulfilled. So when he comes in with the altar of incense, we know that. Everything in that tabernacle, everything in the temple is a foreshadow, a, a copy of what is in heaven. And in heaven, that incense, that altar of incense, is the prayers. The prayers of the holy ones that are lifting up before the God, always before him. All right? So he comes in, the incense is, is, is to cover the mercy seat, and then he's to take the blood. Now, I, I have to confess to you, I don't get this. Okay? I don't know how many of you get this because we've not grown up in a culture where animal sacrifice is something that we depend on. All right? As a matter of fact, we've grown up in a culture that doesn't really even understand animal sacrifice just to eat. We got more and more people that are, that are going, no, you know, you, you shouldn't eat animals. Um, now, that's a personal conviction between you and God. You know? I, I, I exist in the place where I'm not going to judge you for what you eat. Eat all the canned peas you want. <laughs> but I also exist in that place where I go, hey, God said I don't have to eat canned peas. All right? So, but I don't really, I, I can understand intellectually, but I can't in my soul understand why this is so important. But it is because God has put it in his word. So he's to take the blood and he's to sprinkle with his finger... And it says with his finger, do you know that? There's got to be personal connection here. He can't just take a stick or a, or a, a broom or, or anything like that. It's got to be his finger. He has to connect with the blood. The blood then is, goes from him and connects to the, to the, the ark. Okay? But it's not just connecting with the ark. And, and they even specify on the east side. Well, when the ark is set up, which would be the east side? Think about the layout of the ark and the, the tabernacle in, in the tent. Which way did it face? East. The entire tabernacle faced east. The door to enter into the holy place was on the east side. When the ark was set in the most holy place, it specifies he was to sprinkle it on the east side. That would be the front. Okay? And then it says he, he doesn't just sprinkle it there, but he has to sprinkle it on the ground in front. Think about that for a moment. Why does he have to sprinkle it on the ground? You come up with a reason why it's important that he sprinkle it on the ground? Yeah? Let, let's, let's go back to uh, earlier in the life of Moses. He's out chasing down his sheep and his goats. And obviously it wasn't overly important to him because he catches a glimpse of something. And he says, hmm, I'm going to go see what that is. Because that bush looks like it's on fire, but it's not burning. What's going on? For those of you that were there yesterday helping Dennis and Jeannie, I want to say a huge thank you. Wow, it was amazing. Um, I got to look after one of the fires. You notice I, I trimmed? That's because part of it got fused. And you try to comb it out and it's stuck. 
Um, I was planning on shaving for the summer anyway. It just gave me a better excuse. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the fire, I mean, it was incredible. The heat that it was radiating off. I mean, you couldn't get about eight feet from it. And it was like, whoo, wow, that's hot. All right. So he's looking at this and he's like, it's on fire, but it's not burning. I, man, I looked yesterday. Everything we threw in there, fire, it, it, it burned. It, it disintegrated. It melted. Well, I mean, some of the stuff melted that probably shouldn't have been thrown in there, but it was kind of fun to watch. Um, but it all burned up. So there, here's this bush, and he goes, well, I, I want to see what's going on here because I've seen stuff in the fire, but it's not burning. And so he goes, and what's the first thing that God tells him? Why? Holy ground. Holy ground. When he takes that and he sprinkles it, I think he is, it's a symbol that he has got to, that this ground is holy. All right? It's not just the space above the mercy seat. It's not just the ark, but the very ground is holy. All right? So he goes through and it says, he shall take some of the blood of the bull, sprinkle it with his finger on the front of the mercy seat, on the east side, that's the side that is facing him, the side that is presented going out from the tabernacle to the people, and then he's to... Uh, sprinkle some in front of the mercy seat. He shall sprinkle some with his finger seven times. So he takes it. Remember at the uh, Seder, we do the, the with the wine and we shake it off for three times because our cup should never be full when, when we're thinking about the, the suffering. All right, so he's doing this seven times. Seven, well, does anybody know in, in Jewish thinking what the number seven represents? Completion. Completion. The seventh day of creation, it was done. God rested. The, 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 the creation wasn't done until God rested. Okay? The seventh day, he rested. And so, seven times for completion. All right? And that means that it's, it's covered for this year. All right? So, now we're going to go down a little bit. Oh, my gosh. What in the world? All right. We're going to stop there. That's a good place to stop. <laughs> Verse 15, we will pick up there next week. Um, please don't get caught up. If you feel like this is tedious, please don't get stuck there. Because there's a purpose to this. Okay? We're not just looking back on what God told a people ages ago to do. We're looking at that to what it's projecting into our future. Alright? So we're going to dig deep into this. And we're going to see how, why God instituted this and what it has uh, what bearing it has on us. Amen?